Literary Escape. I'm author CJ Peterson, and over here is my co-host, author Michael Scott Clifton. Oh, he needs to turn his phone ringer off, apparently. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Today, we're going to be talking about minor characters. Um, before we get there, though, I wanted to mention that our thoughts and prayers are with Greg, Greg Kelso's family and his girlfriend, Lizzie, as we lost the author world and the Comic-Con world lost him yesterday. So know that our thoughts and prayers are with them and their family. Um, Mike, how was your week? Um, other than my back going out, uh, mm -hmm. it was a great week, yeah. Um, yeah, as I was, uh, had three straight book events and one on, let's see, there was one on Thursday. There was, that was the Longview Art Walk. Then there was um, the uh, Longview Wine Festival. And oh, let's, oh, and I was at the Cow, Cowtown Comic Con that weekend before. So it's like mm -hmm. Saturday, Sunday, Fort Worth, uh, Thursday, Longview, and then Thursday, Saturday at the Longview Comic Con. Well, uh, the Thursday before the Cowtown Comic Con, I was, sitting in a chair and I bent over to pull a box toward me and and I don't know what my immediately felt, felt like someone had stabbed me in the back with a knife or something and I've been dealing with that ever since but um starting to get a little bit better yeah, so. yeah I did have a load of laundry that there shows that we're getting older <laughs> you know it's funny because I've had issues before with my back and in almost every case it's not when you're like picking up some heavy object or something like that. It's a simple, like you turn or you just bend over and it's whammo. Something mm -hmm. happens, but yeah. No, I was mad because it was like two weeks where I had like a heating pad and all that lovely <laughs> stuff that makes you feel yeah. old, like the yeah. Ben Kay and the Icy Hot. And I was mad. So I'm like, it was a load of laundry. I'm like, yeah. seriously? It's never anything that you would think that you might hurt your back doing. It's a simple task that, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess that is a sign of aging. So um, anyway, uh, it was been busy weeks. at Cowtown Comic Con, the Longview Art Walk, Longview Wine Festival, and uh, did pretty good mm -hmm. at, uh, at all those all those events. And I'm excited also because yesterday I uh, started the um, – Lone Star Literary Life book blog tour of my newest book, Pringle Prawn. And, yes. um, and so far, we've had two, two stops. Today's the third. Uh, if, if anybody would, if anyone's interested, you just go to the Lone Star Literary Life website. They have the, uh, or you can go to my website or my Facebook page and it'll have all that information. Good thing is you can sign up and you can win a free book, signed copy, free ebooks, and an Amazon gift card. And it doesn't cost you anything. You just have to go to the website and register. And that's on the Lone Star Book Blog Tour for Pringle Prawn. Yep, and, I will uh, be having it on Shelf Life Blog on the You 18th. will, yeah. So, uh, well, you, and, miss, you can always jump over to my website on the 18th, and you can also enter then. So it's, like I said, it doesn't cost you anything. You just have to enter and uh, got some really good reviews so far. Good. This is my fifth book. Maybe it's sixth of law to go on the Lone Star Literary Life book block tour. For those that don't know anything about mm -hmm. uh, Lone Star Literary Life, they really focus on Texas authors or authors who have uh, themes that are Texas related. And mm -hmm. so... Um, but you can enjoy it whether you live in Texas or you live in England or somewhere in the new Northeast or Southeast, you know, uh, it benefits everybody. If you like a good book, here's a chance to, uh, you know, find your new read for uh, summer. So, or I should say fall. Yeah. And I love being a book, a Lone Star book, book blog blogger, um, because we're always giving away something pretty much with each tour. That's so right you stay tuned. You can be able to maybe, like you said, meet your new favorite author. At the very least, you can be entered into a giveaway. Exactly. So it's definitely a win-win all around. Uh, so what's next for you? So um, the review tour ends on October 19th and really don't have anything else for the month of October, but in November, I, on November 4th, 
uh, let me see, November 4th and 5th. Melly and I will be at the Tyler Comic Con, which will be at the Cascades Country Club Event Center in Tyler, Texas. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on Friday and Saturday, November 17th and 18th, we'll be at Deck the Halls, which is an annual event that the uh, city of Mount Pleasant puts on. And mm -hmm. uh, this is my sixth or seventh year to do that. It's a holiday themed uh, uh, event. And they have lots of different vendors with all different kinds of, of course, you know, many of them related to Christmas. Mm -hmm. So now that's where Mel and I will be on the Friday and Saturday. Very cool. Well, we have relocated to Oklahoma. So we are in the process of shuffling and trying to find various, um, find, find a new home. <laughs> we are currently under contract with the house. So hopefully we'll be moving within a month. So we're super excited, but just trying to get our head above water without shifting everything over to Oklahoma from Texas. So um, we are going on Friday with the Magic Making Mischief crew. We're going to be going to Purgatory Scream Park. Please pray for my heart because I do am aware they do have a spider cave. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, you know, my favorite. We shall see how I come out with that one. Um, so today we're talking about minor characters. Um, Philip is watching. He says, I do have a question about minor character. As I'm creating a story, how can minor characters support the setting and plot of the story? We will get to that and answer your question in just a little bit. Uh, first, Mike, what do you consider a minor character? Well, minor characters do not overshadow mm -hmm. the, the major character or characters, but they are uh, they're essential to the story of, of, of any book. And uh, and it's kind of like um, a football team, for example. You've got a quarterback who may be the main focus of the offense, but the quarterback is only as good as his offensive line, his receivers, and his running backs. He can't do it all on his own. And I, I don't know um, – I mean, a few stories come to mind that have been able to carry be carried solely by – a major character and no one else, Robinson Crusoe, of course, you know, we were stuck on a deserted island, you know, something like that. But those are very rare. And almost always you have to have minor characters that support and actually help define the major character in any story. And I don't think that it doesn't really matter what genre you're in. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether what, you know, what, whether your characters are male or female uh, good guys, bad guys, you know, it's pretty much, uh, you know, the, the, as far as the, the elements go, you have to have minor characters in order to be able to have a major character in the story. Now, and I guess we'll talk in a little bit, but, you know, the minor characters sometimes can be more interesting than the, uh, the major characters. And like I said, we can discuss that later. But anyway, that's that's my take on it. Well, I, I actually like minor characters. Um, everybody knows that I have a series called Team Angel, the Team Angel series, which spans over multiple series and the characters cross over storylines in that some of those minor characters and some of those earlier books ended up being major characters a little bit later. So you, there's a lot of things that you can do with minor characters. Sometimes I had like a minor character that was supposed to be just for one book ended up deciding that, no, they told me that I'm staying and that they're going to last through the whole series. And not only that, but they're going to be great at it and they're going to be a star. So sometimes you intend for a minor character to just kind of be there a little bit, but sometimes they end up shining a little bit brighter than you intend them to be. And a lot of that just kind of depends on what's going on in the story. But you have to have some sort of a support system. Right. So say even Castaway, when Tom Hanks's character was stuck on the deserted island, there was the volleyball Wilson that mm -hmm. was even like an inanimate object, but it was a minor character because that was his friend. Generally speaking, you have to have some sort of a character for the main character to bounce off of, to enjoy, to, um, and tested by fire. Um, the one minor character that pops up is Jenny. She's kind of throughout there. She's Lace. She's what she's the main guy's, the main guy character's sister. And then there's also the BFF to Robin. Um, and he's in there a lot. So it's like you need them to play. Sometimes you need them, like, for example, in the Holy Flame trilogy, 
there was a lot of minor characters because you're dealing with a firefighting crew. But some of those firefighting crew members were able to bring um, depth to the story. They were able to bring humor into the story. So something that's heavy can be lightened up a little bit. Um, those minor characters play a really pivotal role in it. Um, don't put too much pressure on yourself, though, to stick to whatever storyline you've got going. And I know this is the pants in me talking because sometimes those minor characters can convert themselves up in, up, exactly. up in levels. When you're a pantser and you start out with what you think, and I know exactly what you're saying, CJ, uh, when you start out with, with what you think is a minor character mm -hmm. and as you go along, you know, uh, the minor character becomes more important. And as pantsers, when you don't already have a complicated story arc already outlined, you can make the change. Well, hey, we may go with this, you know, and make this person uh, or, or persons mm -hmm. more important in this story. But regardless of whether the minor characters play a larger or smaller role in the story itself, they are essential in defining the major character. Mm -hmm. And without, uh, and you and, and you can't really have a major character without minor characters. I will say that I have found um, down through the years, part of the critique group I belong to and other just sort of learning about writing, um, I have found that sometimes you can have too many minor characters. And by that, I mean, for example, if you're the reader and you have, you're reading a novel by an author that has numerous minor characters. Mm -hmm. It is often, or I should say, it is sometimes hard to keep up with all of them uh, in the reader's mind because the story itself is so populated with so many minor characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you write a story, again, regardless of genre, uh, you need to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have too few minor characters and you can also have too many. Mm -hmm. Well, and then you're dealing like, for example, with Lord of the Rings, you've got the four hobbits. All four of them technically were not main characters. Merry and Pippin, for example, they are your comic relief. Um, and initially they may not have looked like characters that could have put a lot forth, but they ended up saving the day by the one getting the ends to help. So, and then the ends are the ones that helps turn the battle. So a lot of times what I'm saying is that you you may have something that may have looked like a minor character to begin with, and then you just let them go. And you let them tell you the story. If you don't go against the character of the character, they can change and change that storyline. And that's the fun part about being a writer, is that you're not completely and utterly locked in. Um, you can have fun with it. You can relax with it. Um, the minor characters, like you were mentioned, like I said, I have one that has... Um, a bunch of firefighters in it. There's a lot of characters in it, but there has to be because it is a firefighter crew. Exactly. And at one point, all three shifts are coming together. So there's a lot that you've got going on, but the main focus is on just a few of them. So well, thank you, you have Martha. these extent, extenuating little adjacents, but there are some major minor characters. And then there are some major characters. There's the hero, there's the villain, there's the villain's support staff, so to speak. There's the hero's support staff, so to speak. And then there are some that are just kind of thrown in there to go, hmm, what kind of havoc can I wreak? You know, there's there's all sorts of characters that come within a storyline, and each one can add a little element of depth. But then depth, but then there are also ones that you know what? You don't have to give the cashier at the grocery store a name. You don't have to name every single character. That's a good point. Uh, and I think a mistake that some new authors make is they do give minor characters names when they're really just, for want of a better word, window dressing. Mm -hmm. And when you want to invest more into a minor character that really counts in terms of the story itself, you know, again, if you've got, if you name every single minor character who just happened to be, you know, in the room at the same time your story is going on mm -hmm. it's very confusing to readers because there, it's hard to keep up with all of those different characters well, and readers also, pay attention to what authors when authors do name a character especially mine because they know they may come back around later 
Yeah, and then that's a good point. If you if you're going to go to the trouble to name a character, they need to have some level of importance to the mm-hmm. story itself. Now, I don't know if that's a hard and fast rule, but I think it's a I think it's a sound one. Mm-hmm. And another thing is that when you write a standalone novel along that same line, there's a difference between, for example, the number of minor characters in a standalone novel and the number of characters in a series. Oh, definitely. Because in a standalone novels, in a standalone novel, you don't have the you don't have the word count uh, to be able to go too much in depth with too many minor characters because it's a standalone book. But when you have a series, you can actually develop minor characters that may or may not play a more important role in the story itself in the course of each of the books in the series. Mm-hmm. Well, and it gets it gets really fun because you're trying to, like I said, find that balance. But to answer Philip's question, for example, how the minor characters support the setting, the setting, if you're in a school, if you're in a small town, if you're in a large town, minor characters can play a pivotal role. Where is this scene opening up? Is it opening up, for example, in um, the Hall of Fame trilogy? There's a firefighting crew on a fire scene poking holes to try to find out you know, where, if there's any more fire within the walls. So immediately there are some minor characters right there that can help support the setting. Um, When it comes to um, minor characters, sometimes they can be introduced early in the story and then brought around later. For example, in Chain Reaction, it's mentioned that the main character, Tori, ends up getting married and having a son, but that's not her husband later. So that character is going to come back around. There may be that char- there may be a minor character that plays a pivotal role, for example, that may seem like a minor character. There was a pastor in 1922 or 1923 where she was at that she met that told her more about Christ. Comes down a little bit later in 1985 where she meets the grandson of the pastor. And so different characters if they're plotted correctly, can come around and right. make unique twists and turns that you're not expecting. And that's the fun of it. And I think that minor characters, you have a lot more flexibility mm-hmm. in how you use them than say your major your you know your major characters because uh, because you know once you establish the persona of a major character, that's pretty much said unless you've got some sort of, again, elemental system where for some reason they change. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, in uh, I've got th- three standalone novels, The Treasure Hunt Club, The Janus Witch, and the latest one, Pringle Prawn. And the minor character in, the, in each of them is Hank Harper. He owns a very unusual antiques and oddity shop. And Hank serves sort of like the gatekeeper to the story of each of the books. He links, he, he is the direct link to the story and adventure of each book, but he's not the story himself. But he is essential to getting the story introduced and from that point off and running. And, um, and I think uh, another good example of which I use frequently is used to be an old series, I think it was on HBO, but I'm not sure, called Tales from the Crypt. Mm-hmm. And you had the Crypt Keeper. Uh, which was the host of the show that would introduce each of the uh, the episodes. But other than that, he had nothing to do with each of the story itself. Probably and, be off of Hitchcock's in the very beginning when he comes yeah. in and starts his little introduction, and then yeah. it goes on. It's yep. the same idea. Yep. And, and I think sometimes to answer the question about what are they, what can minor characters do to support your major characters? Well. They, they, they are like the, um, the the personnel. You know, like if you're a master electrician and you've got helpers, okay, they're giving you the tools. Okay, give me the uh, the the wire stripper, you know, or something like that. Mm-hmm. They have to serve a purpose to support the major the the you know your your major character, um, but at the same time, they can still be interesting. They mm-hmm. don't have to just be window dressing, you know, they can be interesting. And I think you pointed this out in some previous podcasts, um, CJ, that sometimes 
your, ma your minor characters end up being the major characters of another series or another story because of the way they developed. Yeah, like I said, and you can even develop an entire story from it. Right. You know, you can just make a new series. You can make a new standalone just specifically for that character. For example, with the Sands of Time trilogy kids, um, I will eventually be developing a story um, series regarding all of the kids, all of the kids that were with them. They're not just the main crew from Maine itself and the ones from Willow's Bend. It's from all of the kids in each each kit each group will be highlighted in it so you can do stuff like that and you can even spin off and have them have their own series there's so much that you can do with minor characters if you've gone through the effort of creating them utilize them well, you know a great example of how minor characters are so important to a story and to the major character is the harry potter series mm -hmm. where neville Yep. The Weasleys, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, where, where would Harry be without his friends? Mm -hmm. You know, but each, each, each book was Harry Potter and, you know, mm -hmm. but it was his friends that, you know, that supported Harry and made each of the stories interesting. Mm -hmm. And but that's also, how many books was in that? 10? Was there 10? I can't I remember how many, but that's another example of how, if you do have a series, you have the wherewithal to be able to develop more interesting minor characters than you would in a in a single standalone. And George R. R. Martin's Game of Game of Thrones, another good example of that. Mm -hmm. Another one is the Lord of the Ring things that I mentioned right. was in the one that has like Samwise Gamgee and Frodo. Technically, at that point, Gollum is a minor character, but then a little bit later, they actually tell his story in a different in a different one. So it's like you, where he's the focus and what happened to him and how did he get there and that sort of thing. But he plays a pivotal role. Sometimes it's a good role for a minor character. Sometimes it's a not good role for a minor character. And this particular one, it was not a good role because he wanted Precious. But you get my point. Yeah. Consistency is important. Again, you know, if you whether it's your minor or major characters, you have once you get them established, you can you can show them evolving. Obviously, that's important. In fact, that's often the point of many of the, the, the stories or the novels that authors write, but they still have to be consistent. And your minor characters can't be, just because they're minor doesn't mean that you can make them different than the way you've established your major characters or you have a dichotomy that doesn't make sense in your storyline. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I've seen that happen in in some cases as well, including by some well-known authors. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you mentioned a question last week and I was trying to remember what it was, but it had something to do with the minor characters and can the minor character influence the hero? Right. Totally can. Like I said, you've got two minor characters right there, technically Samwise Gamgee and Gollum were both affecting Frodo in two different ways. So there are many, many ways that you can use minor characters. And like we were saying before, is that you can take them and turn them into a whole series. You can take them and you, people can watch their, their story arc as well. And sometimes that's fun because they saw them when they were first a minor character. So for like the Team Angel series, this character was first a minor character. And look how much they've grown and look how much they're now part of the storyline. And so that's actually exciting sometimes for a reader to follow. Right, right. The thing I, again, one of the things I learned um, the hard way and kind of, you know, the, we have an awesome critique group that I'm uh, part of, have been for the last five or six years. Um, you do, one thing, one of the things I learned early on is that, and you mentioned this earlier and just um, apologize for being repetitive, don't, as a general rule, don't give a minor character a name mm -hmm. if you're if they're not going to be important to the story. So if you're in a legal thriller or or a, 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 a law and order thriller, mm -hmm. okay, there's no reason to give the jailer if you catch the bad guy and you take and book him and he's fixing to go to jail, there's no need to name the jailer. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, you can like when he goes to from the one goes to hand off to another, you can call him whatever the last name is. That's not technically naming the character. That's not describing the character. That's not going in depth on okay. this minor character. Right. You can just offhandedly say that, or like for the cashier, well, Gina, have a great day, and then they leave. You know, that's naming, but not really naming. That's not like saying the fact that this person's going to stand out later. Yeah. No, I was just being polite. And sometimes that's a thing too. And I've seen it. I've, I've seen it. It's a mistake that a lot of young writers that is first starting out make where you're naming everybody. Mm -hmm. There's someone in the room, they all have a name. And, uh, and, and that's just, that's just a mistake that waters down everything that you'll work for in terms of the minor characters you don't want to invest a little bit in. And, and it ultimately really affects your, uh, your major characters as well, because, mm -hmm. uh, because you've spent time and effort with these, these, you know, these, these other named individuals that really play no important part in the story itself. And like I said, I've seen that happen. I've, 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 I've been guilty of it myself, and uh, sometimes the lessons best earned are the ones that you learn the hard way. You mm -hmm. know? But there, there's there's no right or wrong, ultimately, No. in how you write. You write how you write. You write how you want to write, and you just don't go against the character of a character, period. Minor, minor even right. an auxiliary character. You just don't go against the character. The character in the story will write itself. But there are planners who do plan it all out. And sometimes they can plan those little red herrings here and there that have to do with minor characters that can eventually later do it. And then the panthers view is sometimes, you know, we just put the character and the character decides to blow up. Who knows? You know, that's the fun of being a writer and being in control of the storyline yeah. somewhat. As a panther, we're not really in control of our storylines, but that's okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Or yeah. to an extent. But usually the characters just rule it for us. That's the fun part of it for me. I never know how a story is going to end. Um, but that's, that's what makes it fun, right? Exactly. But however it ends, you know, however you decide to put your spin on it, just be careful on how you utilize the minor characters. You know, there are minor characters and then there are acquaintance characters. Be mindful of which one is which one. I think there's advantages because we always talk about planners and pan panthers. Planners, as you mentioned, they they already have those characters in place. Mm -hmm. So they're, I, I guess if you want to say it's an advantage for a planner is you're less likely to go overboard on investing too much in too many different minor characters or or somewhere along that line. Whereas with planners, advantage of, I mean, with panthers, advantage with panthers is that you had the flexibility that if you start off with someone, some minor character you don't really think you're going to put a lot of time and effort in or invest a lot in, they become, as you said, more interesting. And hey, you know, you have that flexibility. Now, this minor character, well, we may need to develop it a, him or her a little bit more because they're going to be a little bit more important to the story than I thought they were going to be. Uh, Philip has one question. It'll be the last question because we only have a few minutes left. Um, is it okay to use storyboarding as a good way to edit your story or a mood board? However you choose to do it, go for it. If you're using storyboards or mood boards, then I'm going to say that you're a planner. Um, yeah. Best of luck to you. We're panthers. <laughs> we just write. Um, but no, that is a thing. And you can do that. Um, that will help you plot it out. My my sister used to put a piece of butcher board up on the wall and she would put post-it notes and she can move those notes. That's the beauty of it being a poster board is she can move them to wherever she needed to until it looked how she wanted it to look. Um, whatever. And we have a friend named Jana. Hers are post-it notes that are, ooh, gives me major hives because they are the exact same color. I mean, everything is color coded per character. So it just depends on what type of writer you are. If that's what you choose to use, go for it. That may help you get stuff lined up better, but don't be planning so much that you neglect to write. That's my only caution for that. Um, so next week we're gonna be talking about the elevator pitch and keeping it simple. Um, we'll discuss what an elevator pitch is, how you utilize it, and how it may help you regarding blurbs and um, taglines and all sorts of fun stuff. 
So we'll hit that next week on the 18th at 11 or one o'clock, same time, same sandbox you found us today. In the meantime, have a great week, everybody.